like you, I sort of started with learning some principles about engaged scholarship from my major advisor. As a doctoral student, I remember my major advisor, Dr. Andre Dolbeck, hiring me as a research assistant. And he was engaged in identifying the needs of low-income people in the uh, community in which the University of Wisconsin at Madison was located. And he was working with the Dane County Community Action Commission deciding how do we identify the needs of low-income people? And so he suggested, why not organize a series of neighborhood block meetings? And in those block meetings, ask the people who come to the meetings like 12 to 14 or 15 at a time in their neighborhood to speak to the difficulties they are having in, in uh, uh, living. And so he did. Uh, he brought with him the uh, officers, of course, of the Dane County Community Action Commission and the other officials. And after introductions, he asked them, well, what are the difficulties you have in growing and in living in this area? And nobody talked. <laughs> nobody talked. So that struck us to say, ah, people are supposed to talk when they come to meetings, but they don't. So Andre sent me to the, to the library, if you will, and said, go find out why people aren't speaking in meetings. Well, we know all of the other reasons why people of minority, of low income, of disenfranchisement, et cetera, do not speak up in meetings. But I did find a paper by Taylor and Osborne in the library that said that people generate more ideas when working alone than when working together. Aha, Andre said, let's start the meeting by not letting people talk. Let's start the meeting by putting ideas down on a sheet, giving everybody a sheet of paper, and writing their ideas on a sheet of paper. Then that went from there to after they've written their ideas on a sheet of paper, they're gonna, we're gonna ask them to eat go in a round robin fashion, individually sharing their ideas without, without interruption, without uh, um, evaluation. And so then there's somebody else who recorded all the ideas on a flip chart, which would now be of course a computer screen. And then um, they were, there was discussion of the 30 or so ideas that were listed to find out which ones are worthy of speaking about. Then there was a general discussion of those ideas and then a vote to find out which were the need priorities in this particular neighborhood area. And so we fumbled along and learned this process of nominal group techniques through a series of about three or four meetings. And that in turn became my dissertation to compare how does this process, this nominal group, compare with the L5 procedures as well as conventional discussion groups? And my research found that, uh, yeah, the nominal group outperforms a conventional discussion group by 40% of ideas, more ideas, as well as uh, Delphi. And second, it found that the nominal group procedure generates far more interest and far more motivation to participate in subsequent meetings then did the, either the Delphi or the conventional discussion group. So it was a hit scientifically, speaking, but it was never, I'll never forget one elderly gentleman coming to me at the end of about the fourth neighborhood block meeting saying, you know, this is the first time in my mind where I felt I could speak my mind. That hit me. The opportunity to engage in doing research that both identifies some new theory, or method for doing work and for having a difference in practice. So it was that that hooked me into a career of trying to find ways to involve people because one thing is for sure, I always seem to track and focus on problems that are bigger than myself. In other words, I didn't know enough to understand the issues I'm researching. So I've got to reach out to other people who have a better understanding of these things. And that in turn then through experience has led me also to be teaching this course on engaged scholarship, which began as this research methodology course, but it still is, but it focuses much more heavily on problem formulation and then theory building and then various methods, models for examining um, research designs 
and of the need for communicating research. And we put that together into a central claim. This is the central claim that underlies the entire engaged scholarship effort. Here we go. We can, I'm arguing that we can increase knowledge for science and practice with four steps in any study. First, problem formulation. Identify the need, the problem, the topic, the issue that we are examining. Up close with a particular concrete example, a face-to-face, -face, in the eyeball, as they say, understanding, appreciation of the situation and from afar in terms of the larger issue, the theoretical issue of which it is a part, by engaging those people who experience the problem. For example, if I'm a human resource person, scholar, I, and I'm interested in unemployment, I need to go find the Joe Blows that we read about every day in the newspapers, where the first paragraph is, Joe Blow lost his job six months ago at ABC Company in this local area. And Joe Blow uh, just returned from his psychiatrist. You see, Joe Blow is not feeling very good. In fact, he is losing his identity. He is losing his purpose. He's having also mental and other physical problems. In the first paragraph, you see uh, what I'm talking about. It's the Joe Blow who can't find a job, who's unemployed, who's lost his identity. And now the second paragraph, from afar, Joe Blow is not alone. Thousands of people have been laid off of work. And all the research shows that people who are laid off of work, nothing much good happens to them. They have all kinds of disabilities and problems that arise. So the research question becomes, what are we gonna do about the Joe Blows of this world? Well, what we need to do is to begin to think about what theories, what models, what approaches might be used to address the Joe Blows of this world. And it's gonna differ depending upon the perspective you have. So after you've addressed your first question in your um, worksheet, you go to the next question. What is your answer to this question? And the answer to the question is gonna hopefully be one that says, I'm gonna do some literature and I'm gonna review the literature in my area or somebody else's area. And I'm gonna identify what is the status quo? How is this question currently addressed? Well, you know, a human resource person would probably say, well, there are about three or four job development and transition programs that are currently being used to try to get people back into work. And as I look at these different programs, one or two of them seems to be uh, leading in approach, but there are problems with these existing approaches. So I'm gonna compare the status quo with a better approach that I think is gonna solve this problem by engaging the relevant experts and knowledge or disciplines and functions and to get them feed, to get their feedback on this approach. So that my basic theory then becomes, I propose that my theory is better than the status quo in answering this question. How? Well, for that now I designed my research to address that research proposition and by developing either a variance or a process study, depending upon whether it's overtime or cross-sectional, and whether or not you can involve the uh, best-in-class methods experts. Because there are truly amazing methodological advances that are occurring in our social science, as you know. But the whole point of this is to then obtain empirical evidence that will help you decide whether your approach versus the status quo is better than to for addressing this question, which in turn then takes you to problem solving, communicating, interpreting, and using the research findings with the intended audience. Now we've got a problem here, folks. Because as you all know, a great amount of good evidence-based research is never put into practice. We also know that all the great amount of good research that has been designed and published in good journals never advances science. These are, for example, evidence from um, uh, studies by Bill Starbuck showing that less than 1% of most management articles ever get cited. Well, if they don't get cited, how do they not advance science? So in a 
truly sad to say, an awful lot of our good research that follows good principles of research design and theory building goes into a rat hole. I'm sorry to say that. So we've got to be thinking much more seriously about how do you communicate, interpret, and negotiate the findings of our research. Writing a paper is only a first step, but it's going to have to require a whole lot more of engagement, serious engagement with our intended audience to identify their assumptions so that when we speak, we're not speaking about things they already know. But on the other hand, we can't speak about things that are simply totally outside of their assumption base. Because if you're outside of your assumption base, you're a quack. Get out of here. If you are speaking to someone who speaks the same as you know, then you're saying, oh, I'm boring. <laughs> I'm not saying nothing, anything new. When we can tweak someone's assumption base slightly, you become interesting. And when you become interesting, then you're going to get listened to. And it is one of these essential elements that we need to understand. Yes, we are social scientists, but we also need to know the rhetorical triangle. The essence of rhetoric is pathos, logos, and ethos. We start our papers with pathos, communicating up close the Joe Blow of this world so I can grab the listener and grab their attention, followed up with logos, here is the logical evidence from the research that's been done about this question and conclude with pathos. It's the right thing to do. It's the morally right thing to do. It is what will help you. So when we start thinking about how do you communicate your research findings, you begin to think like Stanley does, orchestrating your paper so that it starts with pathos, goes on to logos and ends with ethos. And of course, doing this does not occur in one round on this diamond model. It requires constant iteration and fitting. Where you might, you might start off with a problem and then you're going up to theory building and you go to theory building and you say, no, I gotta come back to change the problem. If I do the problem this way, my design has to be done differently or I gotta change the design to fit the problem. So all of these are in play as we are developing a research proposal. That's why iteration and fitting becomes a critical part. And in the courses that I teach, I usually have students go through this process five times and I revise, like if paper one is problem formulation, paper two is theory building, and each time they are to revise and resubmit what they have. And I then give them feedback and they revise and then add another section to get the total paper, the fifth paper. That was the issue. Now, th this can be done in a number of different ways, but I don't need to discuss it other than simply admit that when you look at different research questions, of course, there are to describe and explain, as well as to have more interventionist design and intervention research projects questions. And some of us have attached or detached opportunities to take a perspective. I often recommend doing research with insiders because I'm often the outsider, but it provides them information about uh, understanding the organizations that, that you're studying. Block one, basic science with stakeholder advice is the one I'm focusing on today. It's the one that is highly supported in academic um, universities, PhD and DBA programs. It is the one where the researcher stays in charge, where you decide your research agenda, where you decide and gain access to the resources and the procedures for doing the research. Now, you can also expand that into co-production of research knowledge with teams of researchers, and you can get involved in policy design, research studies, evaluation studies, as well as action intervention. But I would say the standard that's used in most universities today is either block one or block three. So that takes me to the issue of having this overview, practicing engaged scholarship. And the one that I focused on at first is the questions for developing a research proposal. That's going to be our central question for today. But I'm happy to discuss these other six. Um, 
issues. Um, because these other six issues that I'll briefly mention are really incorporated in that first question, the five questions that you have the worksheet on and that we'll break apart uh, on in a little while. One is negotiating the research relationship. We scholars tend to set ourselves up as consultants, which is the wrong thing to do when we are doing research, not consulting. Understand the difference between research and consulting. If you're doing research relationships, you're doing research with another organization. When you're doing research as a consultant, or, or if you're going into a consulting engagement, then you're doing research for a client. Doing research or problem solving for a client creates a tit for tat strategy. In exchange for me addressing your problem, or I in turn will gain access or information to do my study. And that often runs into difficulties. Instead, if you do and you negotiate research with your client, then you find individuals who are interested in your research question and who are willing and interested in doing research with you by providing advice, by participating in some parts of the re research relationship, problem and formulation, or even in research design. But the point is they are doing it with you, not for you. And then grounding the research problem in question. That is so critical. That's the first question in the worksheet. Comparing alternative models. That's the second question in the worksheet. Communicating and using research findings. That's the fourth question. And then designing the research as a learning community. That is your question. Your question is always to think about how can we design our study so that we are learning, not just testing. Because if you're just testing a research model, then you're, uh, you've already got your mind made up. You've got all your questions made up and you're looking for answers in the right way to your questions or your analytical advice, rather than saying, no, stop. I've got to talk to the people who are engaged in this research, including people who might be the respondents in a large database where we don't settle just for looking at large databases, we look at instances, individual observations, and go find and talk to a few people who have, who are in that database and who can provide you some learning about how people interpret the issue. All right, so I am ready to stop now, but and go into a small group workout, uh, breakout. But before I do, let me ask, any questions, any comments, chat sheet? I don't see the chat sheet, but I see there's four items there. <laughs> Jonas, or who would like to raise those questions? Anna Maria raised her hand. Maybe Anna Maria oh. can, we'll give her the word. Hello, Anna Maria. Hello, thank you so Hello. much for your talk. Um, one of the struggles that I've had is narrowing down the research problem to just one. What is your opinion on having potentially multiple research problems in moving forward with engaged scholarship? Very good. I'm gonna address that when it comes to diagnosing a problem. Problems, as you know, are very complex, puzzling, blooming, confusing, and they can always generate lots of questions. And what I'm gonna do is to argue here, once you've identified the scope of a problem and its message, then you've got to diagnose what parts of that problem do you know? What parts of the problem should you not know? That is to say, they're not worth studying. What parts of the problem are so far into the future that they're not worth, that you can't study now? And then find that sweet spot of two or three questions that you could examine about that problem today that could make an advancement in understanding that problem. But then on the other hand, that says, oh, but I can't do all two or three questions in this one study. So I begin to develop a, a, a path. I'll do question one first. That might be my dissertation. That in turn then leads to my next question that I do after 
uh, this study, and then perhaps that may lead to a third question. So what begins then when you start thinking of research as a single study becomes a program of study. Critical in any engaged scholarship effort is that you don't do this in one day, nor in one study. It takes a series of studies, much like Herbert Simon em emphasized. It takes 10 years to become world-class at something. 10 years of hard, dedicated, persistent effort, writing papers, or revising papers, doing studies, uh, revising studies, so that you start thinking about designing your research, not for a single paper, but rather for perhaps a program of research that leads you in 10 years to becoming world-class, okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Others? I think Anoop was next. Hi, hi, Andrew. Good to, good to see you uh, online after such a long time. Um, oh, yes. So nice to see you again, Anoop. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My question for you uh, is going to be very, very uh, specific. Uh, I'd like you to uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about the Minnesota Innovation Research Program, because I think that's a wonderful example of uh, practicing engaged scholarship. So I was just curious to know how you went about uh, negotiating the re research relationship and uh, also some of the challenges that you encountered in setting that up uh, and uh, running that so successfully over so many years. Oh, that's a wonderful question, Anu. And I, it, it took uh, three years to get rolling, but I'm happy to summarize it if I can in about two minutes. First of all, I must say, I did not do it alone. I had to engage with others. And when I moved from the University of Pennsylvania to the University of Minnesota in 1982, the Dean of our Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota was a former executive of the Twin Cities corporate community. And so when I met with him, he offered, would you like me to introduce you to some of my former colleagues? And I said, I'd love to. So I then, with his sending out a letter, introduced me to about 30 chief executive officers in this very rich Twin Cities, Minnesota corporate community. And I went around and visited them. And quite frankly, it was a bit scary you know, not having an agenda in my mind because I had always been a researcher with a clear cut set of interviews and going out to collect data rather than to say, hi, I'm Andy Vanavan, who are you? And what keeps you awake at night and so forth. But I learned that kind of conversation and I found it enjoyable, but also an extremely enlightening experience. And after I met with about 30 of these executives, I found and I tabulated scores and I found that about, oh, 20 of them expressed a great concern on the need for innovation, not in those terms, like saying, we're doing fine now, but I'm really greatly concerned about what is the next basis for competition in 20 years from now. And so after I heard this, I sent back a memo to all of them saying, we've heard, I've heard you, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, you all, many of you expressed a great concern for innovation. Would you be interested in us launching a study that would deal with innovation? And simultaneously, I was doing these seminars back with my colleagues at the university and through a snowballing fashion, beginning to find a host of other colleagues similar to me interested in the process of innovation. And that in turn became a snowballing growing group of about 30 investigators from different uh, academic departments, nine or so academic departments at the university. And uh, we in turn then began to launch a series of exploratory studies in the organizations that express interest as well as in those that we would, we express interest in to do study like 3M and Cargill and Target and all of these companies, but also on, uh, schools, public schools, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, you, you name it. We had a wonderful, diverse set of research scholars. And then we began to meet for about every two weeks, for about four or five years, 
wherein we were working together to work out common hot concepts. And the biggest one for us was to say, how do we study innovation? And after we had done our literature review, the status quo showed that about 784 studies on innovation, all focused on the factors that cause or the consequences of innovation, by counting the number of innovations in organizations, rather than understanding how do innovations develop. So we, as a research team, came to, a, I guess, a mega agreement. We're going to study how innovations develop from concept to implementation, however we can do it. And we tried to develop all kinds of survey instruments and interviews and so forth, but it turned out that none of them could be applied across the diverse settings of 14 different innovations that we were interested in. So what we did was, I guess, the unlawful thing where the research team agreed, we cannot all measure innovation process, ideas, people, transactions, concepts, and outcomes in the same way. So let's make sure we all agree on the theoretical meaning of these five key terms. And then each of us should and will um, operationalize them and collect data. But you have to do it because you see, some innovations take 40 years, like the development of hybrid wheat. That's a 40 year period of work that you certainly can't observe on a daily basis. Others, on the other hand, occur in about six months, like the startup of an educational software company. And on the other hand, some innovations take 10 years, like the development of a cochlear implant that has to go through a food and drug administration procedure. So the rules governing the timing of innovation are established by institutions, by biology, for a variety of other reasons. That's how we got rolling. Does that address it, uh, Kumar? Sorry, uh, it does. It does. But I was also just wondering how you uh, how you got the funding to continue on with such a multi-year study. Well, we we obtained sixteen different research grants. Some of them were funded by the organizations that hosted our research, like 3M and Cargill and, and Honeywell. They provided us research grants because we were studying questions that they were interested in as well. And they participated in helping design the study. Others came from national sources, like the National Science Foundation. We also got some from the uh, um, national um, uh, oceanogranic studies. We got some from the Sloan Foundation. So these were external funded efforts that were very helpful so that we continue to, well, yeah, get money from multiple sources. Um, and we relied heavily upon my co-investigators who were also faculty uh, to continue to fund each project on its own to the extent possible. I see. Uh, no, thank you very much. So if I could just squeeze in one last question. Uh, so one of the sort of significant uh, insights from the study were methodological, like how do you go about investigating innovation uh, using various methods? Yes. Now, clearly that is of interest to the scholarly community, but I'm also assuming that's not of so much interest to the practitioner community. So how did you go about managing that sort of tension between what practitioners want and what's, uh, what gets published? Well, actually, it turns out that we adopted a methodology that was much better understandable by the practitioner than it was by us academics. <laughs> we found that variableizing the innovation process doesn't work. You can't count the number of ideas, people, transactions, context, and outcomes and produce innovation. What you're doing is you're looking at how ideas change over time. And you're looking at how people change over time in the innovation process, which means that you're developing a calendar of events. And you record the date that some of these ideas, people, transactions, context, or outcomes change and the source where the data came from. And then we're going to code that. And then we developed this chronological listing of events, which in turn then we shared back with the people who are on the innovation team. 
and we ask them, does this reflect your memory of the steps that you went through in developing the innovation? That was wonderful because this way, we not only were looking at how we perceived innovation, but how the actors engaged in the entrepreneurial process perceived their experience. Yes, those were not all the same, but thank goodness that provided us a way of expanding and enriching the chronological listing of events. Once the chronological listing of events were possible, then we could apply more of our methodological bit mapping procedures where the existence or non-existence of one of these changing events was recorded. And then we could begin to put them into a time series uh, a monthly time series or a quarterly time series of events. And it was from that where we got some real insights. Like we found that if you look at the time series of events from the very beginning to the end, sometimes 10 years later, the start of, of let's say the cochlear implant, it began in randomness events. Then it jumped down to almost periodic because there was a business plan for starting up the innovation funded by corporate sector, which then in turn began to expand again into chaotic behavior, five, six, seven dimensional space. Then they ran into problems or um, some kind of uh, difficulty in implementing a process. And so it jumped back down to business. And then it, so what you found was innovations begin in random, transform into chaos and end in order. That was pretty cool, we thought applying organizational complexity to provide an appreciation of the truly nonlinear dynamical cycle that innovation processes on, uh, occur in the journey. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yeah. All right, I think um, Nali had a question in the chat. So I wanna give okay. her the chance to pose that one. Yes, how do Please. you? Thank you, Jonas. Thank you, Professor Van der Veen. Uh, uh -huh. My question is, uh, you just mentioned about working with stakeholders and uh, I have posted uh, your prior work about an uh, yin-yang model in a Chengdu bus group. Um, yeah, I, I want you quickly check, yeah, check with you. Um, so what's your experience uh, working with the stakeholders in a bus group? My goodness. It was fortunate that it was uh, Runjin Jing who did the major contact with the bus group and the executive. So it was with me discussing secondhand all of his experiences and notes. Mm -hmm. It was truly insightful. There is something to be said about listening carefully when you're doing engaged work. Rather than to, you have your ideas, of course, your expectations in your head about how, let's say you will run a bus company, mm -hmm. but then you observe this executive who had a set of strategies that so were, well, quite frankly, surprising and foreign and um, competitive to me, which in turn, I thought he would lose the day. But in fact, he made the Chengdu bus company a successful survivor mm -hmm. um, by, Runchun and I, listening carefully to him, we got a sense of what it's like to be using a yin-yang perspective of change rather mm -hmm. than some top-down or bottom-up approach to thinking of organizational change. So my general answer is listen carefully because you're, fine, you're probably gonna hear some yes. new ideas that are not in our existing um, status quo theories, mm -hmm. which provide tremendous opportunities for growth and, and, and learning. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you. All right. So Jonas, can I propose now? that we're almost ready to break out into three person groups. Um, as you know, this was a worksheet. 
that I asked to, and sent in advance with your registration, and I asked you to answer, if you can in writing, that'd be wonderful. But if you can't, to at least be thinking about, if you're gonna do a study, and if you're gonna propose a research project, such as you would for your dissertation, or such as you would for funding for a project you're undertaking, here are five questions that I propose you answer along the lines of the diamond model that I outlined before in my second or third slide. But what I'd like you to do is to think through the research project by first of all asking what problem and question are you studying? And the way to get to that, as was mentioned, is examine how the problem exists up close and then from afar, Joe Blow and unemployment, and with stakeholder experience and knowledge. You diagnose your problem statement to come down to point two. What is your proposed answer to that research question? Here, you compare your answer to the status quo or a competing alternative answer. Why? Knowledge advances with the comparative method. Don't ever just test your own theory. Always compare your theory with the plausible alternative that is ruling for attention. You do not make a contribution if you just test your own theory because you don't show how your theory is better or worse than what we already know. That's why in answer to question two, you should be developing a disjunctive or conjunctive proposition. A conjunctive proposition is of the form, I propose my theory A as better than theory B in addressing this question in this context. A conjunctive proposition is, I propose that my theory adds an important addition to existing theory in addressing this problem in this context. Conjunctive, additive. Once that's done, then you can go to three. Okay, now that I have my proposition clear, I can go and design the study to answer this proposition, to examine this proposition, involving experts to identify the best practice methods. From there, I can go on and begin, hopefully I've begun to already involve potential audience members, so I can all know how to communicate and use study findings, engaging the audience to learn, to communicate, to interpret, and to use the research findings. Underlying all of these are five is the fifth question. And the fifth question is, who is this for? What and whose perspective will you take? We are human social researchers. We do not have a God's eye. If we had a God's eye, we could be all knowing, compassionate, impersonal, see everything, objective. Sorry, none of us are that way. We've all been trained with a certain set of experiences. We've all been pursuing different disciplines of study. And as a consequence, we can't possibly be all knowing. And it's for that reason where we need to know, who do I need to work with to get a broader perspective on my question? And moreover, for whom can I do this study? I can't do it for everybody. So I'm doing a management study, a study of an organization. Am I taking management's perspective? What about the employees? What about the customers? What about the suppliers? All these other stakeholders should have a say on organizational design, shouldn't they? But we as scholars are limited to, we can only handle so many stakeholders. So we need to decide whose point of view will we take to conduct the study? And who will we engage to answer these questions? So we gotta make a choice in answering each of these five questions along the way. And of course, the bottom point, don't go it alone. If there's a one central word about the entire engaged scholarship enterprise, it is don't go it alone. Engage with others 
because the problems, the questions that we are addressing are bigger than ourselves. So we humbly submit that I need help in order to do the research. Okay, Jonas, am I, um, is this sufficient for asking you now to break into three person groups? Maybe each talking five minutes about how would you answer these questions and getting a little bit of feedback from one another. And then we'll come back in 15 minutes for a plenary session where we'll ask, well, what problems, what difficulties did you have in answering these questions? And we'll discuss those. You have to then take a brief break. And then we're gonna go through these five questions for the remainder of our session. Okay. All right, thank you, Andy. Then everybody will get invited to a breakout room now. Um, just feel free to accept the invitation. See you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Shall I keep the um, the live streaming on for now, and then I can edit it out. Sounds good. Ibrat or Jonas, are we in the plenary session or are we going to the breakout room? So the breakout rooms are um, active at the moment. Um, not everyone chose to join the breakout rooms. Andy, I think they're just waiting here in the, in the plenary when it um, reconvenes again. Okay. Should I stay on here and welcome any comments or questions while the people are in the breakout rooms? Yeah, could do. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Anybody who is still in the plenary session, feel free to ask me any questions. This is a good time to do it. I'd love to, Andy. Um, Thank you. And I was afraid my, I have my four year, my three year old son next to me, so I'm not sure he was going to let me speak, uh, but, but I'll try anyway. I'm running That's a wonderful. DBA program in Munich. And um, wow. I think DBA programs are pretty interesting in the sense that they have participants that are both practitioners and academics at the same time. Yeah. So, of course, we have a, a schedule that we run and I've um, included an engaged scholarship session in it. Um, I'm wondering, like beyond running a session on engaged scholarship, what could we do to better integrate and kind of institutionalize um, engaged scholarship into such programs? Do you have any ideas? Have you seen any interesting practices that you could share? Yes, very much. I've been engaged in several DBA uh, programs using engaged scholarship. One at the University of Calgary, one at George Washington University, one at Tsinghua University, and uh, um, and then uh, one at Copenhagen Business School. And in each of these, they are very much alike. You, you, like just like you said, uh, practicing managers coming back for uh, DBA, uh, looking for um, a new I wouldn't say a new career, but it is certainly one that would focuses more on the knowledge intensive society. 
and perhaps going back into academe, but the vast majority of them go back to work at the company where they were, hopefully being more intelligent about how they make decisions and make strategic uh, work. What I, at Calgary, for example, Denise Rousseau from Carnegie Mellon University and I co-teach a course. Uh, it's a three-day course on engaged scholarship where we go through all the steps and the methods of that, that we're talking to today. The highlight of it is these five questions, but they go into some depth in where we ask the students to actually submit a written out research proposal as part of their work. What further would you like about that? I think that's, that, that's good enough. I, I, we don't have the time yet to run like a full course on this. So we have a couple of courses where this is part of. So I'm thinking about kind of alternative ways to do this. Um, maybe just one more thing that maybe uh, maybe you've come across this. Uh, the the, the um, university that we run the course with um, is actually part of a so-called DBA consortium. Executive DBA is their website. And engaged scholarship is one of the three things, one of the three principles, let's say, that they have prominently on their kind of homepage and website. So it seems that the consortium has picked this up as one of the kind of uh, ways of doing research for people like this. Well, it, it seems to fit hand in glove with the kind of directions and the purpose, both the applied and the theoretical contributions that it makes. So indeed, I've been very pleased by the reception of engaged scholarship by the DBA community. Okay, thanks, if thanks you, for sharing. Yep, if you like, that's good, thanks. Also, if you like, I can also put you in contact with perhaps sending me an email to uh, put you in contact with some of the people that I've been in contact with on this. That'd be wonderful. Great. Others? Yes, oh good, there's somebody who has a hand up. Is it Katerin? Katerina? Katerina, right. Um, thank you, Andy, for a short introduction. Uh, I would like actually to ask um, you a question about engaged scholarship because you mentioned particularly that you need to engage those who experience and know the problem. And how about the studies in extreme context? Because currently I decided to involve myself uh, kind of in research and societal mission. Um, here in Finland, um, supporting Ukraine. So um, I'm trying to do action research and study um, digital organizing of evolving um, dynamic kind of large scale uh, collaboration uh, between institutions, between individuals, teams, and how basically Finland is helping Ukraine in this crisis. And I'm kind of also experiencing myself this crisis because my family is from Ukraine. And like, how, what would be your advice? Like, I'm trying to do also research in this time, but like doing research in this time helps me um, to be more focused, to stay more calm also, because it's like, you know, the thing that you love to do. And um, yeah, and I got some also advices from schoolers about uh, like uh, Marcus Hagrin uh, research, for example, in extreme context. But what would be your advice, like in terms of engaging, um, engaged scholarship in this case? Right. What, what, what a wonderful um, reach out you are making, but also what a daunting research you are exploring. My most important point would be to engage with others. Don't try to do this one alone. The complexity of the issue, the horror of the issue, the displacement of the issue is too large. And it may be time too to say, instead of collecting data now, what I need to do is to just get in touch with possible collaborators mm -hmm. who might work with me to develop some kind of a research agenda. If it is research that you can do. Um, I to try to do it alone from Finland, I would guess would be extremely difficult, but I must say, perhaps you have already established the relationships that enable you to get something done quickly. And then the questions of course are too, is this a managerial, an organizational, 
a social, oh my goodness, a war um, project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I guess it's more, you know, the context is of course a war, but uh, what I'm studying and trying to understand is about this um, organizing, organizing multi-level collaboration within the team. So, but I engaged already some schoolers, my supervisors in that. And so we are kind of, I'm not alone <laughs> focusing on all those issues, of course. Yeah, yes. right. But thanks for the, your advice. Andy. Thank you. And Jonas, how much time do we have in this discussion? I'm not following the time. I'm hoping you are. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to just broadcast where we have about five more minutes. Oh, all right. Very good. Oh, good. You brought, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, my question is around process studies, doing process processual research, Andy. And I was wondering how processual research um, fits within the engaged scholarship paradigm in terms of, I, I, I know it does, but in, whether it um, opens up different insights as well as challenges in doing engaged scholarship? Oh, indeed it does. Um, and for me, the process part of research in engaged scholarship is in the research design box. By the research design box, I mean, when we develop a research proposition, the proposition is either one that focuses on how do things develop over time in comparison with something else? Or what causes what, or what are its antecedents? If it's what causes what in the antecedents of something, then you're into a variance study, according to Larry Moore in his 1983 uh, book, wonderful chapter. If, however, you're studying how do things develop over time? Like, how does a new business get started? What are the first steps, the second steps, the third steps? Or how does a individual progress through a career from job entry to training programs and uh, various kinds of appointments? Or how does an organization change from X to Y? Here is where a process study becomes very important. And what's unique about a process study is that you're looking at something over time, not across cases. And so I think of a process study as looking horizontally over time, where time is the main variable. And you're looking at how do ideas change at time one, time two, time three, time four, time five, by observing it over time or getting anecdotal information from records about the historical tracing. If it is a variance, so you're going vertically. How do different cases compare on some variable? In process study, we focus on progressions of events over time. In variance studies, we look at covariation among variables. So it depends upon the research question and the proposition. But in process studies, you would also make some connections, right? So it may not be um, as explicitly causally related perhaps as in the variance studies, but you're still making some connections between different factors coming into play, um, particularly if it's uh, the micro, meso, or micro levels? Well, yes, you know, like when I think of process studies, I usually think of it as parallel tracks of concepts. So I might be interested in ideas and how they change over time by interviewing and talking to people perhaps every month or two or three as a project unfolds. Then I might also be looking at people and the turnover of people over time and observing when do people change their roles or positions or enter or leave. And then I begin to connect those. If people leave, do the ideas change? Or if the ideas remain the same, then the ideas of the people who are successing are following the same route. So you begin to see connections in that way. Is that and, what you're asking about? Yes, yeah, exactly. And just one more thing, um, in the problem solving part uh, within the diamond, yes. um, 
how do you bring out the insights or ideas that emerge from the kind of processual analysis? How do you bring it out to the, to the stakeholders? Uh, what, what has been your experience? My experience has been a couple of things. Number one, they, they like the fact that there's a ring of truth to the experience that we recorded because they also looked at the calendar, if you will, of events and read them and said, oh yeah, that's what we did, that's what we did. Then they get involved with discussions with us, which is fascinating about, well, you know, as these events occurred, what happened or what triggered this or what triggered that? And so here we then do and try to identify those mundane events, a lot of times that happened, but that really transformed like a butterfly effect into some big constant. Or what was supposed to be a big event turned out to be a nothing, had no effect. And it is their self judgment. That doesn't mean that it caused it, but it does provide an understanding of you know, participants' understanding, interpretation of their experience. Mm. And as you know, there are the hard and the soft forms of process research. So are you... Form. Go ahead. Just on a quick side note, I'm going to start bringing people back now. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, so are you saying, Andy, that you, you once you formulate kind of a, a picture of how things evolve over time, and you bring it to the discussion with the stakeholders, and then you kind of work through them again, their perspective and sharpen it up. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. Thank you. And it is, it is that creates the tremendous learning community that you desperately need when you're trying to understand this complex, buzzing, blooming, <laughs> confusing reality of a nonlinear dynamical system. We really are studying in, when you're studying these emergent phenomena, you really are into randomness and chaos as a structure of the time series of events that unfold. And you're not gonna be able to get it with regression analysis because that's only applies to, let's say two or three dimensional space. When you're talking about five, seven, 10 infinite dimensional space to plot the activities that are going on from an empirical point of view. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Thank you. Michael? Yes, uh, I just, I wanted to thank you, uh, Andrew, for doing this. And uh, I've known you for years at the Academy and quoted you many times. Could you tell me one relationship with a CEO, the CEO of choice that you met with and you sat down with and talked about research? I think that would be a good way to segue into the group that's coming in. For us now, it's a simple question. And I know you have many CEOs that you probably met. But is there one that resonated with you? Yeah, I would certainly want to resonate with Lou Lair, chairman and CEO of 3M Company, a person, a, a truly enlightened CEO in the 19, oh, I'd say 1980, 81, 80, oh, 82, 83, 84. And he was a person who was almost like a, a McKnight of the current generation of CEOs at 3M. Very open, uh, very inquisitive, um, very willing to challenge his top managers and uh, district directors and uh, to um, start new businesses and to engage in others. There's no question in my mind that an enlightened and empowerment CEO makes a huge difference in a company. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. I'll put a note into the uh, chat so other people, when they come back, could read that. And maybe very they can good. look at uh, his leadership. Thanks again. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Welcome Andy. back, everybody. Oh, oh great. sorry Please for the back. abrupt callback. Andy, do you want to take more questions or do you want to continue with your slides? What's your preferred course of action here? Well, let's see. We have four questions. Let's deal with those because otherwise they'll die. And then we will start our general discussion. Is that okay? Uh, okay, and I'm great. Hoping I think maybe, 
I'm hoping maybe your comments also will deal with your own experiences. So I want to expand the discussion, not just to one-on-ones, but what was your experience in trying to address these five questions? Okay. So I think David raised his hand first. Good, David. Uh, th thank you very much. I um, actually my, my question was related to um, the brats in the sense that um, I'm trying. I'm interested in possibly establishing a um, causality between two uh, phenomena, uh, and um, I, I think it's fairly easy to establish the correlation, if, if there is, at least to see if there is a correlation. Um, process could be a way to document something that would lead to causality. But I, my question is, is, does it make sense to start with a part of the project to establish a correlation and then later on move to causality? Especially because I, I might have, I'm, I'm pretty sure I will have reverse causality. Question. And Andrew Abbott from the University of Chicago was also a very significant contributor to understanding process research, as well as variance research. He pointed out, you know, when us researchers conduct studies of process, we really ask three questions. First, what is the pattern? What is the process by which something unfolds? For example, if I have to go to another city like New York from Minnesota. How do I get there? Tell me, do I go east, west, north, or south? <laughs> Next. Oh, so I start east. What roads do I take? Tell me, one, two, three. Third, where do I have to stop? Where do I have to refuel? Where do I have to run into difficulties uh, in construction sites? In other, in other words, Tell me what's the pattern? What is the sequence for me to get from Minneapolis to New York? Then the second question, well, what caused this? Well, I got to get to New York and I'm in Minneapolis. So you could have thought about, instead of driving, I could have thought about an airplane. So why didn't you consider using an airplane rather than driving a car? or for that matter, taking a bus, or for that matter, taking a train. Notice there's three options I could have taken. Now the question is the third. So what, which one was the best? Well, actually the one that got me there the fastest if I had done all of these alternatives was an airplane. The second was probably using a train. The third may be the bus and the last was the fourth. So I started off with the wrong pattern. So notice what I did. The first question asked, what are the patterns or the alternative routes, processes I could have taken? Second, what causes you to choose certain patterns? Third, what are the outcomes or the consequences of taking those patterns? The second and the third question are the causal questions. The first one is a process question. You got to start with a process question. That makes sense? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, was it Nasrin? You had your hand up. Thank you very much, Professor Vandavan, for sharing your insights. I would like to go back to your previous discussion, like you already discussed part of it from Dr. Nair's question, like the negotiating negotiating research relationships. I think in, in the case of PhD students and for the faculties, the things are a little bit different. As a student, I have to define the boundary or maintain the focus of my research. But if I want to be engaged with the other stakeholder, it seems a bit different. I need to stress my boundary. Then how do I balance that relationship? If I ah. specify, I want to study the eco relationship between different ecosystems in artificial intelligence and health. For my research, I know that I can keep it small and um, the boundary I can maintain the focus, but I, I want to start more data because a lot of data are not publicly available. I need to engage with the other stakeholders, but the stakeholder wants me to do something different. 
And then there is also the case of time. Well, you raised some great questions. And for me, they deal with the question of scope creep in a study. Almost every study I engaged in, I always have the urge for expanding the boundaries and creeping outward in order to respond to or incorporate the ideas of others in your study. Here I come back to the principal point. What is the purpose of this study? If this study is my own doctoral dissertation, or if it is a study that I have to do for a research project, that's what these five questions are about, a research project. These are not five questions for doing a literature review. They are not five questions for doing an essay. They're not five questions for doing a meta-analysis. Lots of times you could say, okay, I've got this project going on and I will connect my project with somebody else's project, but understand I'm crossing that boundary, but I'm not going to envelop my boundary into theirs. Okay. My biggest fear for many junior researchers is that they allow their study, they no negotiate their study beyond capability. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple, stupid, <laughs> is what we say all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very okay. much. You're very welcome. And John, you had a question? Uh, yes, uh, my name is John. I come from uh, Roskilde University, Denmark. and. Uh -huh. And actually, I'm running a course where we use your book uh, because oh. it uh, relates very well to problem-oriented project work, which uh, which our students use half of their time to do those kinds of projects. So we, we have now been running this uh, engaged scholarship course for, for some time. And actually, at the moment, I'm doing an engaged scholarship project in, in the building industry and building sites. Oh. Where you where you had the problem of so you know uh, laws about security on building sites, knowledge about security on building sites. Uh, you actually have a lot of knowledge about what creates accidents on on building sites. Uh, but the problem is that the literature shows that actually uh, building workers are not kind of <laughs> following the rules. They 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 don't learn from the the, the knowledge uh, you have about what creates accidents on building sites. And that's why uh, I, this in this project we have a development project where we try to put in a process between. You could say rules and 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 and, and knowledge and then uh, practices on local building sites, right? Uh, and actually, we've been in in, in we we have been inspired by Carlyle's uh, knowledge translation uh, framework. You know, uh, is knowledge transferred uh, or does it has to be negotiated? Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, it has it it has to be translated and so on. So we kind of use use that kind we use that kind of. That is exactly the framework that I'm using in the problem solving uh, phase of the diamond model, Carlisle's yes. framework. So please go it, ahead. Yes, I, I know, I know. Uh, but but actually, what happens there that that it, it, we we have a team, of course, uh, you know, co-constructive uh, team consisting of project managers, um, supervisors, very important persons on building sites, right? So the people yeah. supervising the building workers, very close, and then we have security uh, people knowing about the, the the building security rules and and knowledge, and then of course we have researchers here, and we kind of try to negotiate, okay. So what, what are the practical experiences of, 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 of building workers on these building sites and, and, and how does their knowledge kind of, uh, you know, uh, play a part also when you compare to some of this small law related and, and, and research based knowledge and, and we kind of negotiate there in, in that uh, team. And, and I just found it very difficult actually, uh, you know, actually people are supposed to to you know translate laws and knowledge into practice but but actually there's a lot of go, uh, translations going on in the group in order to okay how do we actually uh, design some interventions here and and, and try to work more practically with uh, you know uh, issue for instance you can have a, a, a dig a hole digged out and and the practitioners will say away i have a feeling of of the dirt when when the dirt is dense we don't have to put up protection <laughs> Uh, you know, when you have a five, me five meter uh, deep hole, but 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 then the rule said that they have to, 
but sometimes they say, oh, we don't need it today because the, the dirt is very hard, right? So, so you have that negotiation going on. And and my question to new, uh, you now is that that it makes me, uh, uh, you could say, uh, skeptical about the, the, uh, the ability of translating research-based knowledge and and rule based knowledge into practice right because we, we all this hard work that goes in actually into not just transferring but actually translating and also negotiating uh, the kind of knowledge that should count in practical situations where for instance you dig holes right <laughs> so so i i know you have edited a book on 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 uh, the translation um, uh, knowledge translation and i just wondered what what your kind of uh, key advice to, to a project like ours would be in relation to you know uh, running this these kinds of knowledge translation processes very good excellent question and do you see uh do you see my slides right now do you see where i'm am, am, am i on share screen or not uh, i don't know you have to share again okay let me see i want to find here um Um, are you there? Yes. But Do you we... see my slide here? No. Um, I am going to have to go. Okay, I'm coming back here. More. Stop. Oh, my goodness. Okay, live. There we go. I found my share screen. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with my inability to get things done. Do you see my slide screen now? Yes. Okay. And let me just open this up a little bit further. Uh, slideshow here. Okay, now I'm coming back to where I wanted to be. Right here. Your question <coughs> struck me right here as focusing on the very first question. Here is Joe Blow digging his hole. From afar, there are regulations about what is the statistical average about how deep you can drill without having a um, the sand fall into the pit. So the answer to my question is, if you are a good engaged scholar, you're going to talk to enough Joe Blows to find out up close, in particular, in this particular situation, what how far can you go? And then you talk from afar to be gaining the knowledge that prior studies have shown about what are the statistical averages. Notice. The very step in problem formulation is a move in theory building. You go from particular, up close, Joe Blow, to from afar, the theory, employment. Employment means nothing unless you take it back to up close. Up close doesn't mean a lot until you can link it to something from afar. Here, your engineering company. If it was, if, or if you were the engaged scholar, you could make a huge contribution by linking the up close to from afar. And that means you're crossing levels of abstraction from particular characteristics of the soil and nutrients to the from afar, the composition of geological earth. <laughs> I don't know this area, by the way. Does that address your point? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And Raymond, you had a question before we break it out to others too. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank first you. of all, it, it's a pleasure to listen to you. And thank you. you might remember I was once on the uh, <coughs> executive board of the ODC 2000 to 2002, yes. um, some, uh, a few years ago. 
but my question now, it pertains to the following. Um, I, we were part of a major effort at the moment when the Cold War ended and the new beginnings appeared in Eastern Europe, but also in Russia. Uh, we did some work for the EBRD. We went to different cities, the twinning. Uh, Sheila um, um, Puffer also did that from Northeastern University. So um, we went to teach, share, and help transform the military complex towards a more market economy. And we did this with colleagues who were teaching management already before the, uh, the Cold War ended. And to our great surprise, we also saw that they had most of our textbooks. Uh, they were studying us, but they interpreted the textbooks differently. Now, looking back, you know, we were doing all this capacity building work, and in that sense, really boundary spanning large macro, uh, and changes appeared, and then came the chaos of the top leadership with Yeltsin, uh, and shock therapy on top of it, which just really put in an enormous disruption of the change, uh, emerging change period. And then came uh, Putin. So we will, I was just wondering, is there any method that we could use to look back over this period of promising change, capacity building, new uh, enterprises emerging, and then came the asset stripping oligarchs who finished it off. But I don't know what method to use. You see that uh, history, we have a division on history, but most of the work they do is about intra organizational history, about the leadership or about what happened, but not at this macro level. W would history still be useful, even though? When we talk, always talk about evidence. <clears throat> how much evidence can we? Uh, but the hypothesis that you know everything has to be based on evidence. Well, if we take such a larger, broader um, perspective, it doesn't make sense. To, you said it just before. If you have not just two or three uh, dimensions, uh, we have many how to make sense of macro change? That's my question. Wow, <laughs> Ramon, what a challenging question. I recall about that time I was, I think, president of the Academy of Management right. in 2001. Yeah. And in my presidential address, I recall, I guess- You talked saying, about scholarship. Yes, I was talking about scholarship. And I was talking and lamenting about the economists from the Western world who were going into Russia and other Eastern countries, applying their Western models and theories of economics and creating truly havoc in the Eastern and Russian economies at the time. And I recall saying, it would be far better if we as management scholars would go to Russia and to the Eastern European countries and learn and listen to what models are currently being used and how they might be modified mm. to fit their local indigenous situation yeah. rather than to imposing their Western tradition upon the East. The conclusion being from an engaged scholarship point of view, it has to begin with listening. It can't begin with telling my theory to do. No. And in retrospect, how to make sense of what happened? The retrospect that I have is that a problem of social science as you know, worldwide, has been the colonization of social science by the Western, European, and American brand of scholarship mm. that is now being imposed or peddled or branded upon the rest of the world as, quote, good mm. science no. in the quest for universal knowledge. I think what we are sacrificing 
is knowledge of specific indigenous problems mm. by focusing on general theories, by trying to create general theories that apply across context, situation, and specific, in which case we lost sight of the specific issue, the specific problem up close. Our field has focused far too much on afar and too little on up close. Mm. That's my take. Yeah, thanks. It's reassuring. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, it is, and I need help from Ibrat and Jonas. I see it's 30 minutes before the closing time. Is that correct? That's correct, Andy. And so what shall we do? Shall we continue on? Do we want to take a five minute break because our bodies need it? Or what would you like? <laughs> I think we still have um, at least one question in the chat. Um, the person oh, okay. can't turn on her microphone. So Please. I would just read it out if that were, if that's okay with you. Please do. Um, so the question is about, um, I'm working on the problem of climate risk for financial institutions. So how does one engage with practitioners on a problem that they are still trying to conceptualize and understand, especially in an emerging market like South Africa? So in essence, my question is, how does one collaborate with practitioners on a complex issue that organizations are still grappling to understand, as is the case with climate change risk for financial organizations? That's a wonderful question and also a wonderful opportunity. I mean, that's just when you want to get engaged with and talk with the people who are trying to figure out how should we deal with the question? Because they are inquisitive. They have a question. They are looking for a solution. They don't have their minds made up yet. So my only hope is that you in South Africa have already established a personal relationship with the organization or the managers who are uh, asking these questions. And if you haven't, Go find someone who can introduce you to meet with them so that you can begin to engage in that conversation and where you can begin to ask them, well, how do you think about it? And they'll probably ask you, well, how do you think about it? And you could answer, I would be happy to share my opinion, but I don't know. I'm not the expert. I am interested in studying this question just like you are. Might we do this together? That's how I would negotiate that relationship. Okay, I'm just gonna say thank you on behalf of the person. Um, thank you. So we have about half an hour left. John, are you okay if we uh, let and Andy continue with the presentation and put your question to the end? Okay. In that case, Andy, I think you wanted to go into the five questions more in detail, is that correct? I did. And so what I'm gonna do now is go through these five questions, parts of them, only because it's a whole course. <laughs> And or um, I want you to feel free to express your opinion as I go along. I do have some criteria for answering a good research proposal, and you can read these by yourself. I don't think I need to discuss them, but I'm happy to do so. If you review my slides, you are, of course, have access to them. I talked about negotiating the relationship and I talked about it in terms of doing research, the last point, doing research with and not for practitioners, but also recognizing that engaged scholarship is a participative form of inquiry. It's an identity of how we view ourselves. Don't view ourselves as experts, as God's eyes. View ourselves as practitioners. View ourselves as participants in this process. It's a relationship involving negotiation, mutual respect, and collaboration. That's the identity that I think underlies engaged scholarship. And we talked about grounding the research problem, up close and from afar. But I didn't say much about diagnosing. This is crucial to define and classify the data elements in this problem statement, to identify the general case of which it is an instance and to make an inference or a claim about the problem to formulate the research question. So for example, suppose you go out and talk to people and you see 
and you try to map the problem into this space. And it's a um, pretty blurry space. And of course, there's a lot of holes in this space that goes outward. But anyway, that's kind of a representation of the problem space. The first problem of the problem space, if you start looking at the literature, is that you're going to find that we know quite a bit about that problem or phenomenon in the literature. Identify those theories that seem to explain what we do know about this problem space. Then look to the other part that's less known. That other part that's less known, some of it is not worth researching because people's minds are made up. It's taboo, it's an undiscussable, whatever. Then look to other areas of the problem space that are totally unknown, that are not reachable. And put those out because you cannot actually do a good research project. You could do a nice essay, but for a research project, you got to get down to the sweet spot. Ah, here's a question that might lead to the second question, which in turn might lead to the third question. And then in my dissertation or my first study, I'm going to study question one, which may lead to question two. And as I study question two, I might expand what we know. I might decrease what we don't know. And that may take me to question three and out as a way of developing a systematic program of research on the problem. Have you done this to diagnose your problem? I've been using that in the courses that I've been teaching and it helps students a lot. Now, if you don't want to do it in terms of defining what we know and don't know about your problem space, you could also define it in terms of different disciplines. Maybe a known part of the problem now is what we know from sociology. Maybe this part is no, what we know from biology. Maybe this part is known from psychology. Maybe this part is known from economics. And so that you can begin to say, well, if I look at and diagnose my problem, maybe I need to look at it from multiple disciplines because each discipline raises some important issue. Okay. So what I do in my class is I ask students to fill out this worksheet on problem formulation, where they state their problem that they're studying up close and from afar and to diagnose it, and from that diagnosis to come up with that research question that they're going to study in this project. Once you've done that, then you can situate it by identifying, well, who is this for? What's the level, the scope, the boundaries of this research question? That then becomes your theory. Now we go to the second part, and we talk about that second question. What's your answer? And the answer is our answers are usually too weak for the problem being studied. Arthur Stinchko at Northwestern University unfortunately died a few years ago, but he wrote this very influential book, which I find extre extremely helpful. But he pointed out that many of us study complex problems that exceed our capabilities of any one theory. So we can study these problems better when we use alternative theories. Don't ever settle for one. So it is here, as you just heard me say before, develop disjunctive propositions of the form. I propose that theory A is better than theory B to address the problem in this context. One thing's for sure, knowledge advances with the comparative method so compare alternative theories. So once you got this, so you've developed this disjunctive proposition, what you have is a claim from a theory, or pardon me, from an argument structure point of view. And Stephen Tullman, the great British logician, as you know, set forth this structure of argument that I find extremely helpful for getting the rest 
of your research proposal together. Given the background, the problem up close and from afar, the question, the context of the claim, he proposes, I propose theory A is better than theory B in context A. This is your disjunctive proposition for which you need reasons. The major premise is underlying the claim. Why is this claim true? Well, we know this and this and this. Well, is there evidence to substantiate these reasons? Well, these are the minor, minor premises, data backing the reasons. Now, as we all know, any given set of reasons and evidence are subject to reservation. There are limitations on the grounds for rebuttal, such as the logical reasons that you use here are not valid. Or the empirical evidence you present here are not truthful. Or it may be that your argument is just not persuasive, not coherent. But in turn then, should lead you to qualify your claim. Well, I propose that maybe my conjunctive or disjunctive proposition only holds in certain assumptions or boundary conditions or cases. Now you folks, many of you folks are from the UK. I presume you understand the Toulmin structure of argument pretty well, don't you? It assumes a courtroom model where it's worthwhile to note that we as academics are in a courtroom model in proposing our work, where all assertions and all our assumptions are contestable by an opposing counsel. They're not our friends. They are other scholars who have adopted a dialectical approach as the nature of discourse in our science. Well, there's a final verdict about opposing arguments that will be rendered by a neutral third party, a judge or a jury. And that judge may be the journal editor or the funder plus the review committee that's making the jury decision. It's not you, it's the others who are choosing your argument in comparison to others. The opposing counsel focuses us to anticipate counter arguments and assumptions to answer opposing arguments fully without rancor. This is not my personal interpersonal conflict. This is an issue of focusing on task and to present positive reasons for our case and negative reasons for the opposing case. And above all, do not construct an argument that appeals only to those who agree with us. Comments? It is for these reasons where I emphasize the importance of this Toulmin structure. For on the one hand, you have to have a good disjunctive proposition that compares alternatives. But on the other hand, you need an argument to explain why your argument is better than the alternative through this process. And that then takes you to communicating in using your research knowledge. And here's where the Carlisle framework, I think is so important and so useful for us academics to learn how to better communicate our research findings. Because our typical approach has not worked. Any comments about that that I need to add further? So the way I put it all together is at the end, at the last assignment that I have for my students is to put all this research proposal together into a generic tree diagram of their research project. And I asked them to put it all on one sheet, a single sheet, basically organized this way. It starts with an opening scene, an introduction, an overview, a motivator, that in turn takes you to the problem. Joe Blow experienced this problem and from afar, the issue of unemployment 
which takes you to a diagnosis of what we know and don't know about the Joe Blows and what should we do about them? My research question is, the answer to my research question lies in the existing body of literature. The current in theories on my question are these. In practice, they work this way. In theory, it works this way. And there's a gap, an anomaly. There are limitations to these, to the solution. So I propose a better solution. My answer is better than this status quo. My argument for it is as I've just discussed, the claim, reasons, evidence, reservations, qualifications, and the conclusion that my answer is better than the status quo. Therefore, now I'm gonna test it. My research design, we didn't talk much about it, but it's the process and the variance model in the research site, the iron element, sampling, measurement, all these things, and the method for communicating my research findings and conclusion. Support and about this generic tree diagram that it's all in front of everyone on one monitor. And now you can entertain questions. What do you think? What suggestions do you have? Provide me feedback. And someone can ask questions about this design, Others can ask questions about this gap. Others can say, oh, there's a good paper about this. Oh, there's something you missed about that. This is tremendously helpful in fleshing out your research proposal so you go around the diamond model several times. And the last point I had was, obviously, we are the researchers. And the purpose of research is to learn. It's not to consult, necessarily. If you want to be consultants, go ahead. That's fine. I have nothing against that. But it is to say, distinguish when you're doing research and when you are consulting. When you're doing research, address big questions that withstand the test of time. Big questions are the ones that capture the imaginations of practitioners just as much as researchers. They're the lightning rod that bring people together. If you can't find that, then you got to keep on finding other ways to formulate the question. Then recruit colleagues, stakeholders who wish to learn. And quite frankly, a minority of our stakeholders wish to learn. They may not be interested. They have more important things to worry about. So the consequence is it takes maybe one in seven or eight people, stakeholders, colleagues, who wish to engage with you on this project. That's the way the world works. Not everybody is ready to jump on your door. Then recognize that to do this, I have got to conduct a study over an extended period of time. I'm not going to build or have a capability of building meaningful relationships unless I've met with people several times. And in fact, before I even conduct a study, I've come to know people so that I in turn feel trustworthy and they can trust me. And as we get involved in the project, we are building this relationship and renegotiating it with mutual respect and collaborative learning. Hopefully what happens then is we develop this interactive expertise, a capability of understanding one another's boundaries so we can communicate across those boundaries, much like Harry Collins talks about, um, about the need for developing interactive expertise. He pointing out, you can't study a domain which you have no interactional expertise. <clears throat> and then of course, in conclusion, I argue, adopt engaged scholarship method of research. So in summary, my conclusion after we still have 10 minutes for comments is answer the five questions in the research proposal, negotiate the relationships with practitioners, ground the research problem up close as well as from afar, generate alternative, not simple models, cross barriers in communicating research findings, design the research as a learning community. 
Thank you. Open for any comments. Thank you, Andy. Um, John, you had your hand up earlier. Do you still want to pose your question now? Uh, yes. Uh, I just wonder, you know, with doing um, research collaboratively, uh, it's a bit like, you know, building on the ideas of uh, democracy and a kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like Habermas is, is talking about, uh, a communication process where you kind of negotiate uh, what, what has to count as, as knowledge. But I wonder in, in collaborative projects, sometimes there is a power imbalance. Uh, for instance, in healthcare, if you go uh, try to do co-creation uh, projects in, in healthcare, you have doctors, uh, surgeons, for instance, who are very dominating and in, 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 you know, they are the experts and kings uh, of knowledge in their field. And if you have to collaborate with doing collaborative research in, in a clinic with, with uh, surgeons, uh, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, other types of occupational groups and, and try to negotiate and create knowledge together, uh, you, you would sometimes be dominated by the doctors here. So, so, so how does power uh, you know, imbalances play into uh, collaborative uh, research projects. Uh, yeah, yeah. And how do you handle those yeah. things? Uh, power, power infuses not only research, but any kind of social relationship, doesn't it? Yes. We live with this every day in the classes we teach, in the colleagues we work with, in all of our engagements. There is always this power asymmetry and power equality. Um, and the answer is, huh, I don't think engaged scholarship has any particular solution other than emphasizing, start thinking about methods like the nominal group technique that reduce these power uh, imbalances in interactive meetings. So to identify the need or the problem, don't just go and ask people, what's the problem here? because the physician is going to demand his perspective or hers. Instead, conduct a novel group meeting where the physician sits with the nurse and the technician and the others listening to how they express the problem, which increases the likelihood that they might modify their own stance. Thank so you. Also, with regard to developing the research proposal and the designing the research. So, the strategy here is, yes, we live with power imbalances and social incongruities in research just as well as we do in everyday life. But in everyday life, we are learning methods for equalizing that form of discussion. Leaders that have this capability of empowerment are crucial for dealing with these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice answer. Thank you. Oh, Narsen? Yeah, thank you very much again. And uh, I have two questions. The first, yeah. when we build our argument about the status quo, that my argument is better than the status quo, how do we maintain the balance between the status quo and the originality? Well, what is you, you maintain the balance by pointing out what is the status quo. This is the answer that the existing body of literature proposes. Now, there may be two or three or four answers, but I would focus on the most prevalent, the most widely accepted answer in the status quo. Now, that's going to take some careful literature review to do. But once you find it, then you can say, now, given that, here are the limitations of the status quo, or here's a need for the status quo to go further. It is by saying, Conjunctively, I'm going to add to the status quo and improve it. Or conjunctively, I'm going to say, I have a better solution than the status quo. That might replace or change it. Thank you very much. And when you say compare the alternative models, do you mean that comparing with the existing alternative models or finding the existing different alternative solutions for what I'm proposing. For example, I'm proposing this, but this can also work. 
I would say, focus not on yours, focus on the question. What is the status quo answer to the research question? Okay. Then you, tell me how your answer is better than the status quo. Okay. By the way, Collins wrote this wonderful tome on sociology of knowledge ever since the uh, antiquity. And in his sociology of knowledge found that on average, there's about only five or six theories that are competing to answer a given research question. Only five, because of small numbers and that people get, the social science community can only drift apart so far, it finds, it comes to about five. So that when you're looking for the status quo, you're looking for one or so of those five theories that you can challenge and hope that when you're doing your study, you can find that maybe you can reject the status quo, which places your proposal in the running for one of the five. Thank you very much. Yes. You brought? Oh, no. I, Anup. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, two interconnected mm -hmm. questions from my end, you know, both related to the topic. Uh, in your article uh, and in the book, uh, the Engaged Scholarship uh, book, uh, you have actually compared and contrasted three different reasons as to why knowledge co-creation is not popular within academia. Uh, you'd compared uh, the model of, oh, uh, theory and practice are different. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a translation problem, i.e. a trickle-down problem versus, oh no, it's a co-creation problem. So when you have uh, undergraduates and graduates who are actually steeped in the first two models of knowledge uh, institutionalization, if I might use that term, uh, then uh, uh, how do you actually go about attracting uh, excellent caliber PhD students to do engaged scholarship. Uh, and the reason I asked that question is because again, uh, you've, uh, you've had the wonderful opportunity of working with so many PhD students who've gone on to become uh, wonderful scholars in their own domain. Uh, people like Raghu, Raghu Garud and uh, uh, Douglas Pauly and uh, Marshall Scott Poole and the list goes on. So I was just wondering, you know, I mean, is there a, is there a trick that we need to know as uh, 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 supervisors of PhD students in terms of how to attract high caliber students uh, and uh, hook them into engaged scholarship? Wow, great questions, Anu. On the one hand, there are different ways of thinking about knowledge. And uh, engaged scholarship does not take you very far on knowledge transfer because it assumes you've already worked out the problem, the question, the solution. It's just a matter of translating what you find from research into practice. Well, Andrew Pettigrew has said it very nicely. Well, if the wrong question has been problem, uh, developed, there's no point in transferring it. That's point one. That's not to say that no knowledge can be transferred, but a good, when it comes to research in the social sciences, an awful lot of knowledge is not a transfer problem because that's another thing. When knowledge of practice and knowledge of science, they're just different knowledge. So a bicycle, I can tell you all of the mechanical parts of a bicycle, but it'll never tell me how to ride a bicycle. That's a practitioner. So the whole issue of balance and stuff like that, I can't teach in an analytical way. So knowledge of science and practice are different, but they're both needed to ride a bike which takes you then to the third. Well, let us start to recognize that the knowledge of practice and the knowledge of science each contribute in different forms of knowledge about the research question that we have. That is the engaged scholarship issue. So then when it comes to working with doctoral students, the thing I always enjoy very much was when we came home from our interviews, we drove home in a car, of course, from the hospital or the clinic or wherever uh, company, 
And we would always ask ourselves, well, what have we learned from this discussion? And what often came up is how they thought so differently about issues than we did. And it was this beginning to appreciate that by discussing this on a regular routine basis, we come to recognize ourselves that we live in a world of different views of knowledge that are okay. One is not better than another, they're just different. And we can then take advantage of those differences by creating more insightful perspectives. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and, and that second uh, part of the question, uh, Andrew, uh, in terms of how do you get high caliber PhD students hooked on to engage scholarship? I'm not sure. Well, my hunch is this, it's done by practice. Take your doctoral students along with you into the field. Just like my major advisor took me into the field. I would never have become, I think, an engaged scholarship had I not been hooked, hooked on the nominal group technique. And then learning through the school of hard knocks how to do it and not to do it because there's been a lot of hard knocks about that too. But I see we're out of time, so I can't get into that. <laughs> sure, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>